In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. When Luke sketches the early church like he is, like he does in the Acts of the Apostles, what he's really doing is providing examples to us about the nature of the church in the first century. So the early church, like in, if we were taking a course on, it, <clears throat> so in university it's called ecclesiology, that's church talk for the study of the church, ecclesia. So in ecclesiology, the very first um, part of the history of the church has two sections in it, or it can be subdivided. One is this that we're hearing now, which, which we will hear now about when the apostles were alive, and then the what how the church grew after the apostles were all dead, but before the Nicene Creed was written in the year 325. Those two parts together make the early church, okay? Now, so right now we're in the apostolic church. Hellenists are Palestinian Jews who spoke Greek. So Palestine is where they live. Some Jews spoke Hebrew. Some Jews spoke Greek. And what, what Luke is referring to in this first part are all the Jews that converted to this way. We're going to hear that again in the gospel. The way, Jesus as the way. Remember, they weren't called Christians right away. They were called people of the way. They followed the way. Okay, so in this, the, they were Jews, former Jews, former, that's going to be important later, Jews who spoke Hebrew and Jews who spoke Greek. So lest we um, forget, prejudice and bias is as old as humanity is. So the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, felt that the Hebrew-speaking Jews were getting all the attention and the care and whatever was being given out. Widows is also important. Remember, in apostolic times, widows had no means at all because the men gave them legal status as well as money. And if they were widows, they didn't have a man, right? So they were completely dependent on people giving them what they needed. And I'm talking about food, okay? And whatever else they might need. So um, the widows of the Greek-speaking Jews didn't feel like they were getting treated equally to the widows of the Hebrew-speaking Jews. So, and they made this known, which they should have. So the 12, I want you to notice that it's 12. So before Pentecost, remember Judas had died, so the 12 was 11, but um, they, M Matthias was picked to round out the number to 12 again. So they're 12 again, because this happened after Pentecost. The 12 came together, they're the leaders uh, of the church, the apostles, and they called together the community of the disciples. Okay, just a little thing, but this is important. Apostles, if you go to what the root meaning of the word is, is people who are sent out, out, away, out, go, do. Disciples are people who gather around to listen and learn, like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates gathered people around them to learn. They were listeners. That's what disciples means in its root word. Jesus had disciples, all the rabbis in first century um, Palestine. Rabbis had disciples. You would join up, so to speak, with a rabbi um, whose message either spoke to you or whose message you liked. That's how, that's how it would be gathered. So disciples are the learners. So the 12 are the apostles. They're, they're the ones sent out. They're calling together the community of the disciples. That means the people who are gathering around and listening and learning. And they say, it is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve his faith. Okay. A couple weeks ago, I put down the word kerygma, K-E-R-Y-G-M-A. That is a collection of, of oral, not written down, but orally what made up this early faith in the way. And so when this is said, when the 12 say, it is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve at table, they do mean preaching it, 
but they also mean formulating this core, which is called the kerygma, which shapes the people who are on the way. And it's not necessarily written down. Kerygma is not necessarily written down. It is ultimately, but not immediately. So taking care of the people who absolutely needed care was, was um, splitting up their focus, which makes sense. Anybody that's trying to work at, from home now and has children is finding that. It's very hard to keep your focus when your little one, you know, needs lunch and, or is crying or there was a fight and you have to go break it up or all of that. So it, the, the setup is kind of the same. Okay, now um, I marked these men, Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. Those are seven men and they laid their hands on them. Now, this is, uh, this is important. They used the word diakonos, not as deacon. We later put the word deacon on these guys. But when Luke wrote this, he used the Greek word that meant serve without naming them deacons. And here's what's interesting. All these names, Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, they're all Greeks. Now, there's a couple things that's really important about this, and then I'll tell you why Stephen and Philip's names are darker. It's significant that when the early, the apostolic church hit a wall, very soon after Pentecost, when these um, Hellenist widows said, look, you know, we're hungry too, nobody's given us anything, and the Hebrew-speaking uh, widows are getting more than we are. We may not even be getting anything. So the apostolic church hits that wall and immediately, what do they do? Immediately they regroup to address this. Now we in fact don't know if the Hellenist widows were being um, not attended to because of this, of a scarcity of resources or because of prejudice. We're not told. But either way, there's a need that's not being met. And for people on the way that not to attend to a need would just be against the very definition of who they are and just had been made into by the spirit event at Pentecost. So this is what's important. The early church did not hesitate to restructure their hierarchy to respond to the need. I cannot tell you how important that is because 2,000 years later, now granted, it's much larger, but 2,000 years later, that's not ever within the scope of how we look. But for them, okay, if this isn't working, okay, let's restructure how we are who we are. And there wasn't even a politically correct amount of Greek men who were in this group. Everybody was Greek. So I'm bringing attention to this because this is huge. This is big. Now, the reason I marked Stephen and Philip with a heavier print is because out of all of these people named, we really only hear later about Stephen, who will ultimately be stoned to death, and Philip, whom you might remember, appeared miraculously to the eunuch traveling, who was reading the Bible and wanted it interpreted to him. Philip got in the cart and um, with the Ethiopian eunuch, explained the scripture. The eunuch saw a body of water, asked Philip what was to prevent him from being baptized. Philip baptized the guy and Philip disappeared. Kind of like the story of Emmaus. There's a presence, there's an exchange, there's a recognition, and there's a disappearance. So we hear about Philip in that story. We hear about Stephen in a number of times after this. And then, of course, then he's stoned to death. This whole story actually is a setup to introduce Stephen, who, is, who plays a very significant role in the, in the apostolic church. Apostolic, I'm talking about meaning in the time of the apostles, not the apostolic church of God, which we're familiar with around here. So this is called the Apostolic Church because the apostles are still alive and part of it. Okay, now laying hands on them. This is such a lovely gesture. Um, and I think we're familiar with it as a sign, I'm gonna say, as a way 
to share, uh, no, to transmit, to transfer power. So that for instance, when Josh will be ordained, um, the, all the priests that, well, now I don't know how many priests can go, but however it's gonna have to be worked out, the priests will all make a line and go past him and lay hands on them, sharing, showing that by this gesture, Josh will share in what they have of the spirit. But there's also a piece of laying hands that um, is sometimes lost and yet is very, I think, profound and significant. It is a sharing of power. It's not just a transfer of power. It's a sharing of power. So it's a communion. It's, it's something that is pulling a person in to a community or a communion. It's hugely powerful expression. So for instance, at last, uh, last August, before the last school year started, I was with a faculty from St. Barnabas, and as part of the prayer, the principal, as, as the whole, which was a sizable faculty, as everybody was around, the principal went around and in silence laid hands on all of them. I see what that meant, what that, what that was a gesture of was the belonging of this ministry of teaching that we're all in it equivalently. It, it's a sign of communion. So they laid hands on them and then, then the, but interestingly enough, we don't hear what they did. We're presuming that the widows were taken care of. And also what's interesting is both Stephen and Philip, when they are mentioned in the book of Acts, they're not mentioned as doing this ministry of caring for anybody that needs care, including the widows. They're shown in explaining the word. There were people of the word. So it's not like the, um, the work of the church was pigeonholed. You know, everybody, and everybody responded to whatever need there was. But what's significant about this is the setup of this whole section. So which in, in scripture talk, we call it a pericope, which is just a story from, from the book of Acts. The whole purpose of this pericope is to set up Stephen, who has a bigger part as the book of Acts goes along and is ultimately the first martyr for the faith. And both Stephen and Philip are portrayed in the book of Acts as people who are um, preaching the word. What I, the last thing I want to, I'm not going to go into this, but do you see the last line there? Even a large group of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. This would be like a whole nother class. But what was significant is that if Jewish priests were becoming baptized and becoming people of the way, priesthood was being redefined in a new way. And it was interesting, but it's, but it's way too long. I'll just note that, that that was important.